Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'd like to welcome you aboard the ship's hands. How are you all doing today? Great, okay, let's have lots of energy. Please laugh at my joke. My name is Vera. So if you have questions during this tour, please Toronto, the largest city in Canada after Montreal, lies on the north shore of Lake Ontario. It was founded by colonial Americans who remained loyal to the British Crown after the American Revolution. With the finest harbour on the Great Lakes, it flourished on shipping and solid investments. Canada's steady economic expansion since the 1950s and its easy access to the United States has turned Toronto into an international commercial centre. But between the new skyscrapers, its civic and domestic architecture offer reminders of the colonial past. Peter Ustinov once said that Toronto was what New York would be like if it were run by the Swiss. He may have been thinking of the city's orderly, if relaxed, air, but he could have been referring to the ease with which people escape from the hard-edged surroundings in which they earn a living to the spacious retreats in which they enjoy their life. Out in the leafy suburbs, where for many the day still begins with a farewell wave from an old-fashioned porch, there are plenty of things that the Swiss, or anyone else, might envy about Toronto. High on the list is the well thought out interface of roads and public transportation. The passengers being delivered to this subway station will probably be at work before the driver who brought them can get back home on the freeway. Before the goodbye kiss grows cold. As regular as its own timetables, the Toronto subway wins awards for the safest, cleanest, smoothest running system on the North American continent. Without it, Toronto would be an entirely different kind of city. Not only do more people use the subway every year, but those who do use it increasingly often. The average passenger now takes 200 trips a year, compared to only 150 in the mid-1960s. The subway is the critical part of what Toronto is because it was built over about a 20-year period, at the same time as the population of the city of Toronto doubled. We have, I think, two overall goals. First of all, it's simply to provide best transit service that we can within the resources that were provided, which is a complicated business in and of its own. We've got to get the people on and off the trains every morning. But the second has been to support a land use plan and to support a, a development pattern that will make transit work. Until 1953, the streetcar and the automobile were adequate forms of transport for a place that was still something of a backwater. But at that critical moment in Toronto's growth, the city fathers showed remarkable vision. In partnership with the surrounding communities, they gave the Toronto Transit Commission some stirring orders. $67 million was invested in a heavy-duty, no-frill subway as the backbone of their people-moving plan for the future. Only well outside the central area of Toronto do trains run on the surface. For many of the underground sections, the builders were able to use the cut and cover method, digging a trench for the track and roofing it over afterwards. But where hospitals and other important buildings stood above, they had to tunnel, running the lines through huge tubes to muffle the noise of the trains. There are two subway lines running roughly east-west and north-south. The routes cover 35 miles and carry nearly half a billion passengers every year. The most heavily used part, 
The beauty of the system for most travellers is the U-shaped loop of the north-south line that stitches the downtown area together like a thread. During the first ten years that the subway was in operation, 90% of the new office buildings erected in Toronto were built within a few minutes' walk of the dozen or so downtown stations. Along the length of the line sprang up sub-centres, which are now virtually cities in themselves. From this control room, the trains speeding along are under constant observation. A computer helps supervisors to set routings and check the progress of traffic. Cars are wide and comfortable, even when packed during the morning and evening rush hours. And they and the stations are virtually free of serious crime. Young was the first line of the system to be built. Where it intersects the east-west Bloor and Danforth line is the busiest station in town. It's also deeper than those that serve only one line. Both below and above ground, it has become Toronto's principal crossroads. Keeping the conflicting streams of commuters apart is work for experts. The uh, biggest problem would be the synchronization of the crowds from one line to the other. When there's a minor delay on one line, that causes a backup of trains and therefore a surge in the crowd flow from one line to the other. So you could have on the east-west line a five-minute delay, then all of a sudden you have a lot of people coming on the north-south line trying to squeeze onto one train. You, you can only get about a thousand people on a train. And so in rush hour you can have three or four thousand people at the station at one time. You notice in the afternoon they're in a hurry to get home more so than they are to get to work. But uh, you get a lot of rush. The rush hours now are lost, lasting longer than they used to as well. There's more and more people out going to work. Toronto works in ways that many other cities don't. It has, has a terrific infrastructure. The way the different services relate with each other, whether it's the transit system, um, the surface transit, the road systems, the computerized um, uh, efforts that have been made to, to keep traffic flowing, the uh, citizen um, activists who've stopped expressways from going into the center of the city. Um, the desire on the part of everyone to keep it working. Uh, it's constantly boasting that it's one of the few North American cities with a vibrant set of downtown neighborhoods. Charlie Pachter may be the Toronto subway's most unexpected fan. He finds it both an inspiration and an opportunity. At the time, I was looking for work uh, I had heard a rumor that they were contemplating a mural for one of the stations and I um, started to think about the placement in this station of something monumental and I realized of course that hockey is to Canada what wine is to France so what did I do I took the two historically most famous rivals in Canadian hockey history the Montreal Canadiens and the Toronto Maple Leafs one team was blue and white the other was red white and blue I wanted to get my work out in a public um, space and I'm very um, mindful of the fact that one image in front of 40,000 people an hour can do more for you than 100 shows around the world. I would probably like to see more stations as events rather than just places that you pass through. For example, given the choice, I would have liked to have done the entire 
a platform in hockey players. They only gave me 35 feet. That's all I was allowed. But those are the little things that you're up against. You know, when I would have a grandiose scheme, I'd get a phone call from the head of the TTC saying, well, you know, it's not an art gallery, eh? It's a subway station. <laughs> you know, that sort of practical, and our subway, as you can see, is nothing if not practical and clean and matter of fact. Cleanliness, matter of factness, Toronto virtues. Above ground, Toronto, like most of Canada, is snowbound for much of the year, but the remainder offers an enviable outdoor life. The summer is all the sweeter for being short. For these few weeks, it's hard to imagine the harsh winter ahead. While the sunshine lasts, everyone makes the best of the lakeside. This has always been a city of immigrants. After World War II, Toronto became a cosmopolitan city. A wave of displaced Europeans diluted the original English, Scottish, Irish mix. Getting here however they could. Some of the newcomers did pretty well for themselves. Welcome to Honest Ed and the great, great city of Toronto. Here in Toronto there's a famous man, but this guy must be insane. His prices are so low, any day he'll be broke. Honest Ed is his name. Well, I've been in Toronto 65 years now. I was nine years old when I came here. I don't know if there's any big secret. I had very little formal education. I had no schooling. And almost 50 years ago, I just, when I just getting married, I cashed my wife's insurance policy for $214. And we started a small store in this same location. In fact, there's a sign in the corner window. It says the original store was smaller than this window. And that's how it started. And uh, I think there was never a plan, but it was just an evolvement and a development. And uh, today we have about 400 employees in this store, and it takes away a big part of a block. The gaudy discount emporium that bears Ed Mervish's name is not his only interest. He owns one of London's most famous theatres, the Old Vic, and runs it in partnership with the Toronto's Royal Alexandra Theatre, the keystone of the city's own considerable theatrical tradition. Hello, Jason. How are we fixed? Have you got the figures all ready? That's good. All right. I think you can make it in many of the great cities of the world. But Toronto is my home, and uh, it has presented opportunities, and I've taken advantage of them. Toronto is a very different city today. I think it was after the Second World War that so many different nationalities uh, started to arrive here. And I think it made Toronto a better city. The different cultures, the mosaic of different people, uh, is what makes Toronto what it is. The Italians were the first wave of arrivals from Europe, then every nationality sought out its corner. Ukrainians, Hungarians, Greeks. The most recent wave of immigrants comes from Vietnam and Hong Kong, enlarging the earlier Oriental community many times over. Enormous investment from Hong Kong, ready money looking for a safe home before the colony is integrated into China, has accelerated the growth inspired by the subway. The deeper Toronto digs, the higher Toronto soars.
No matter how much snow falls on Toronto, how bitter the wind sweeping across the lake, the subway ensures that everyone gets to where they have to go, warm and dry. Inside the downtown loop marked out by the subway, a vast underground city has come into being. It covers 14 square miles. There are atriums, escalators, restaurants, galleries of shops that any city would be proud to see above ground. Its heart, Eaton Centre, occupies two city blocks on its own, a subterranean pleasure land where even the weather is forgotten. Banks, office blocks and hotels can all be reached through the basements of the surrounding buildings. 74 entrances altogether. In the 1920s, when the United States, across the water, was in the grip of prohibition, many a shady fortune was made in Toronto from bootlegging. Today, brokers come in on the subway to tend the financial locomotive that powers the city's prosperity. This is now one of North America's top volume exchanges. Gold and other minerals, equities, standard commodities have taken over from the port commerce. Property too. The lakefront on which Toronto's earliest fortunes were founded is now so valuable that more of it must be created by reclaiming land from the water. Everyone in town wants to live there now. The apartments in this building, number one, Quayside, went on sale for a minimum of a million dollars each. Everyone was snapped up within the day. But not everyone was pleased to see that kind of money being paid. Now, you might be familiar with the term yuppie, young urban, urban professional, okay? Well, this is their heaven, this is where they all live. Harborfront is now the chic place to live in Toronto. They've all been built within the last three years, they're very expensive. First building I'd like to point out to you is Queen's Cape Terminal with the green glass windows. Have any, have any of you visited the terminal building yet today? Yeah, it's really nice. Expensive too. All my paychecks go into that building, Queen's Cape Terminal. The ones in the far right with the green sloping windows are called King's Landing condominiums. Very beautiful when the sun shines on the windows because it looks like a waterfall reflecting from the building. Now they run anywhere from 500000 to three and a half million dollars a piece. Not a little bit expensive, but with this price, you do get a private mooring area for your yacht. In pre-subway Toronto, some of the better lakeside views were only to be had from public housing tenement blocks. The area was harder to reach then. There were no moorings for yachts and pleasure boats so close to the business centre. But when the harbour front light railway, a largely surface system integrated with the subway, is finished, stockbrokers and bankers will be able to get from the office to their expensive new condominiums without getting their galoshes wet. Mingling economic groups in this way is something Toronto seems to deal with as deftly as shape is imparted to the rails that will carry the harbour front trains around the curves. In many ways, the light railway was one of the Transit Commission's more complex projects. Deciding to spend $50 million was merely the beginning. Part of the track lay through a tunnel. The maze of cables and plumbing put down by the clusters of existing skyscrapers had to be avoided, moved or diverted. Building the tunnel alone ate up half the allotted cost. The completed harbour front line permits passengers to connect with mainline trains as well as the subway system proper. 
That's the way they like to do things in Toronto. Integration of public transport has been the key policy of the Transit Commission from the beginning. Toronto's surface routes have, of course, spread far beyond the subway's reach. They're organized on carefully calculated grid plans, and detours and new destinations added as demand increases. The same one fare ticket will take a passenger to any stop on the entire system by train, bus or streetcar in any combination. Those first old streetcars, rounded up in the United States and given a coat of municipal paint, were labelled Red Rockets. Their successors still run. Their timetables, like those of the buses, coordinated with the subway. Every streetcar stop has a telephone to tell travellers when the next one will be along. So much a part of the city are the Rockets that the 50th anniversary of the opening of their first line called for a party. As a matter of fact, a lot of the streetcars that we bought, like today, the birthday party for the Red Rockets over here, were streetcars that we bought from other North American cities. Because in those days, they were putting in diesel buses and not believing in something of a rapid transit nature, such as a streetcar, which was really a forerunner to some extent of a subway. There's no question that you can't have major development in a city without rapid transit, because people in the city believe in using rapid transit. It's not a social economic system, unlike some cities in the world where people go because of their economic, uh, their economic situation. As I said to you earlier, a president of a bank would be on that subway, or a, a doctor, or a lawyer, whatever profession. He'll be riding the subway just as much as anybody else because it's convenient, it's, it's efficient, and that's the kind of system we want. So that it's very important to any development as to what the trans where the transit is going. Toronto now has twice as many people to move about as it did when the first subway line opened. The planners, by redesigning the city from beneath, have been able to keep pace with such dramatic expansion. And there'll be more to come. We're going to see in Toronto, I think, a, uh, a replay of some of the dynamics that happened in the United States uh, 20 or 30 years ago, the conflict between the car and transit. People don't decide to leave their car at home because transit is cheaper. It's always cheaper. But if you can provide service, and this is where the subway comes in, then the investment in service uh, is what works. And this is what's worked in Toronto. Except for the very, very high end of income, and people who have three or four or five cars, almost everybody in, the, in Toronto uses transit. It's just taken for granted that everybody uses it. It's a community service. We're in the middle of that debate right now. That is, what the decisions taken by Metropolitan Toronto and by the other levels of government over the next three or four years, with respect to that dynamic, are going to determine the shape of Metropolitan Toronto for the next 50 years or so. and those who can't move out to what are now suburban apartment complexes and use the subways to come into work. How is this going to change the city? It would be very interesting to watch the next decade. The temples of money are rising around us everywhere. There are, um, uh, there's a whole new lifestyle called condominium lifestyle. It's, there's a kind of Manhattanizing of Toronto that's occurring. That Every corner of every major street now has buildings with two or three floors of commercial and sports facilities and athletics and meeting rooms and then the apartments for the single gentrified downtown uh, consumer. This is a big change. The city is booming and there are danger signals all around. 